Hello everyone, how are you? Hello sir. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa alaikum assalam. So should we start? Yes sir, I guess. Okay, something about the final exam. Your final exam will be online. It will be on Tuesday. August 3, 2021 at 6 <clears throat> Okay. So, uh, So initially we had this idea that uh, our exam will be on campus, in person, on campus, but now it seems that it is impossible. So uh, we will have our exam on the same time as announced previously, but uh, now it will, be, it will be online. So how would we conduct this exam? So it could be very similar to the one that we, uh, I mean, it, it could be very similar uh, to midterm. So we will, ha we will have uh, it on Zoom. So I will upload uh, the exam on LMS. Okay. It will open at six. Uh, I'm not sure how long it will be. Uh, we, we already have like two hours and a half for the final exam, but I'm not sure we need to use all of the time. So it will open at 6 p.m. and uh, I will let you know that how long it is. And uh, what you would need to do, uh, you need to uh, log in on Zoom. Uh, keep your cameras on. And um, you will solve the exam on uh, some sheet, for example, on, on sheet of paper. Okay, and then once done, upload the PDF file. Okay. Just one PDF file. with your name and ID clearly written on each page. Uh, what do you mean by assignment type or proper exam? Okay, <clears throat> I, I think that's that's uh, clear that um, how we will have our exam. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, there are, I mean, there was one announcement about um, class participation marks for this course. So I have um, sent the link of one of the uh, link, link to a form, a Google form. Uh, so you just need to write down that how many times in in, in all the weeks, uh, which were for the weeks of this, this semester, you were present in the class. 
so I will use that number to calculate uh, the class participation marks. I have other data as well. That data will, I, mean, I have that data from your discussion and emails and, and the questions that you asked during the class and the questions offline and online. So I have that data and I have some idea that who, who are the active students. Uh, and I will correlate with the data and I will uh, assign those marks accordingly. Um, sir? Yes. Sir, regarding the final exam, can you please uh, give us an additional 10 or 15 minutes, depending on the size of the paper, to uh, scan and approve the paper? Uh, yes, I will do that. Uh, in fact, I, I will not do it explicitly. I will uh, give you ample amount of uh, time to write your exam and scan as well. So it, it's up to you that how you decide and divide it. So plan uh, properly. So you know that this is the exam. These many questions are there and this much time you will take to solve them. So take like five minutes to 10 minutes time as a spare time uh, where you can scan and create a PDF file and upload it on LMS. Right, yes, so, okay, sir, thank you. So, so there will be plenty of time. Okay, uh, with that, I think we can proceed. <clears throat> So probably this is, uh, no, not probably, this, this is our last class of the semester. Uh, usually I treat my students in the last class of the semester, but now uh, it's, it seems impossible. But anyway, when, when you, uh, when you all, when all of you are on campus after some time, we can, uh, you can come to my office and we can talk about things. Anyway, so let us begin uh, our discussion about complexity. Okay, so where did we where did we end last time? NP completeness. We have to start. Yes. Yes, sir. You need to define the uh, NP completeness. Yes. Just give me one second. So we need to talk about NP complete. Okay. So let me start directly with the definition and then we will, um, I will explain that what, what does it mean. We say that a language, V is NP complete. if it satisfies following two conditions. First of all, B is in NP, okay? And condition number two, every language A in NP reduces to B in polynomial time. Okay. In other words, so, so let me write it uh, uh, mathematically. So we can say these two conditions are like B is in NP in condition number two, for all languages A in NP, a reduces to B in polynomial. <clears throat> okay, so this is very, very simple definition. What does it say? It says that suppose this is the class of languages which we call NP. Okay, so forget about uh, the class P. Just imagine this is the class NP. So in this NP, we have several uh, languages, infinitely many languages, so many languages. 
we say that a particular language, let's say this particular language is B. This particular language B is NP complete. Okay. First of all, if first of all, if B is in NP, and we, we know that B is inside NP, therefore uh, the condition number first is, is fulfilled. And condition number two is that, that every other language that you find here, that for all languages A in this class NP, every other language. So let's say if I, uh, if I say this is blue, then every language which is marked as a black dot here, that language will reduce in polynomial time to B. Okay, and I hope now you understand what is the concept of reduction. Do you remember what was the reduction that we, that, that we defined? So when we say that a language A reduces to language B, okay, a language A reduces to language B. If we can solve language A using the solution, for language B, right? Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so this was for, from the point of view of, of solution, but we had uh, another uh, definition. We said that if F is a polynomial time computable function from sigma star to sigma star, okay? <clears throat> When we have a language A and we have a language B. So we say that W belongs to A if and only if F of W belongs to B. Okay. Then this function F is called polynomial time reduction. Is this in clear? Yes, sir. Okay, so there is there is a question, an interesting question. Uh, the question is that how do we know that every language in NP reduces to A, uh, reduces to B? So how we can make sure that this happens? <clears throat> we will uh, we will explore that how we can test it. Just give me some time and uh, just few minutes, and we will come to that. But before we go there, we have a very simple result. We say that if B is NP complete, so this is theorem. If B is NP complete, okay, and B is a language in P, then P is equal to So remember our discussion over P, NP, P versus NP question. And I said that if you could solve one of those, one of those problems, which are in NP complete, uh, and, and you show that it, there exists an efficient and an easy solution to the, one of those questions, then P will become NP. So this is exactly what it means. It says that if B is any NP complete problem, any NP complete language, and we also know that B belongs to, to, to the class P, then automatically P is equal to NP. So it means that as I showed in the picture, if this is the class NP and there is one problem B and we already have shown that B is NP complete. Okay. And we also show that, so first thing that B is NP complete and second thing is B is equal to P. If this is what we can prove that, that this B belongs to the subset of NP, which is P, then it will mean that boundary of P and NP will collapse. Okay, so this boundary will collapse. And everything that is in P will become NP and everything that is in, in NP will become P. So this will become just one class rather than remaining two classes. Why? Can you prove it? Proof is not difficult actually.
it uses the fact if you can if you if you understand this definition then you can prove this theorem can anyone try um sir yes is it something like uh, every language a that is in np reduces to a language b that is in p so n p is equal to n p yes exactly so let's see what is the formal argument so let's suppose c is some arbitrary language uh, which is in np so if C is in any arbitrary language, which is in NP. So we need to show that every A in NP is polynomial time reducible to C, okay? We need to show that every language A in NP is polynomial time reducible to C, okay? But since B is NP complete, why? Because it is given in the theorem. It says that if B is NP complete. So if B is NP complete, then according to the definition, every language, every language in NP must be reducible to B, right? Therefore, every language A is reducible to be in polynomial time, okay? This is the definition. Okay. Oh, there is some mistake. Just give me a second. Sorry, there is some mistake. I I, I mixed up a few things, a couple of things. No, this is not the proof. The proof is very simple. It, it, it follows from the definition. How it follows from the definition, because the definition says that so so the theorem says that if B is NP complete and B is also in P, then P is equal to NP, right? So if B is NP complete, then every language in NP is polynomial time reducible to, to B, right? It is polynomial time reducible to, to B. Okay, therefore, if B is in P, then every language A in NP is reducing 
to reducing to B, which is in P. Therefore, we can use the solution of B to solve every language in NP. This is impossible, okay, which is, this is impossible because we define a language to be NP because we cannot solve the solution. We cannot, we cannot solve it using a solution in P. But since we already have to, we, we already have proven that B is in P, this is only possible if, an, if, if this is only possible if uh, P is equal to NP. Otherwise it is impossible. Okay, so it follows from the definition of uh, the polynomial time reduction. Anyway, so let's move on and what is more important theorem here? So let me show what is the more important theorem. Here. If B is NP complete, And B reduces to C for, for some C in NP, then C is NP. So this is the question uh, that somebody, somebody asked on the chat that, so we know that in order to prove some language to be NP complete, we need to first show that that language is in NP. And the second thing that we need to show that every language in NP reduces to that language. Now we cannot show that because there are infinitely many languages in NP and we cannot come up with a reduction from those infinitely many languages to that particular language, right? So it is impossible. So what we do? So we, 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 we do a little neat trick. And that trick is that actually there's a property of reduction and that reduction says that, so forget about this theorem. So this is independent of this theorem. This property says that if there is a language A, which reduces in polynomial time to a language B, and there is a language B, the same language B that reduces in polynomial time to another language C, then the language A reduces to language C. This is called transitivity. Okay, this is called the transitivity of reduction. So this polynomial time reduction is a transitive operation. That is, if A reduces to B and B reduces to C, then definitely A reduces to C. Now we can use this transitivity property to prove this theorem. Okay, and this theorem is exactly the question that somebody asked it, that how we, how we can show that, that some, some language is NP. So what we need to know, we need to just know one NP complete problem. If we can show some problem to be NP complete, then we can use that problem to show any other problem NP complete. How we can show that? It's very simple. We would use this transitive. Okay. So in this theorem, it is given that B is NP complete. So we, we are not required to show that B is NP complete. Okay. So we are we are given that B is NP complete problem. So if we know that B is NP complete problem. And there is another problem C such that B reduces to C, okay? Then we can show that C is NP complete. Why? Because if B is NP complete, if B is NP complete, this implies for every language A that is in NP, A reduces to B, okay? But we also know that B reduces to C that is given from the theorem. Now, these two things are exactly the things that we know from the transitivity. This implies for all languages A and NP, A also reduces in polynomial time to C, okay? And we also know that C is NP, therefore C must be 
complete. So C must be NP complete. Is this in clear? So we don't have to actually show each and every language in NP complete, uh, each and every language in the class of NP to reduce to, to an unknown language to show that that unknown language is NP complete. What we need to do, we need to come up with, with just one reduction from any known NP complete problem. So if you can show that one known NP complete problem reduces to that unknown problem, then that unknown problem must also be NP complete. Is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Okay, and, and one problem that was shown to be NP complete, the very first problem that was shown to be NP complete was the set problem. So we have a theorem which says set is NP complete. Okay, and this theorem is for the group Levin theorem. This is the theorem where uh, Cook and Levin proved that set is an NP complete problem without using this definition of uh, NP completeness, where we need to show that every problem in NP reduces to this one. Because this is the first problem to be shown as an NP complete problem. Therefore, we do not we do not know any other problem that was NP complete. Right. So this is an important theorem which does not use that definition. Uh, of NP completeness to show that that problem is NP complete. Okay, so it is important to uh, to read about this theorem, and it is important if you can read the, the proof of this theorem as well. So I, I'm so this this proof is not part of this course. Uh, this proof is a li little bit involved. Uh, I'm not planning to uh, give the proof over here. I'm not, I will not show you how this this proof is done. Uh, but this Cook Levin theorem actually shows that set is NP complete. Okay, so I will stop here for the Cook Levin theorem and we will come back to set problem. So we talked about question. set. Yes. So, so if you're given any problem and you're asked if that problem is NP complete or not, we have to come up with one uh, problem that is already known to be N NP complete. But yes. that problem must be reducible in polynomial time to the problem that we're trying to figure out. Yes. Right? Yes. So, uh, like, is that something that we have to guess, or is there any way of finding it out every time? Uh, there is no way to guess, actually. It's, it's all uh, creativity. So, for example, when some unknown problem is shown to you, to, to for example, if you're working in some field, and uh, this has happened to me previously in past uh, multiple times uh, where I was working on some problem. It was, uh, it's, it was a new problem and I did not know the solution of the problem because either we created that problem or that problem came up automatically solving some other problem. So it was a brand new problem. But by looking at the problem, by investigating it, it was clear to us that um, this problem is difficult. Uh, this problem would require a lot more computation power to solve than any other problem, like sorting or searching or something like that. Uh, so immediately we thought about maybe that problem is NP complete. Okay, and what we did, uh, we tried to figure out the structure of the problem. And looking at the structure of the problem, we thought that maybe some known NP complete problem that that we already knew uh, as, as a suitable candidate to to reduce from. Okay, so we would. We would think about some some of those problems, and we would try to reduce one of those NP complete problems to our problem. And if we could reduce it successfully, okay, and we could successfully show that the problem, that the unknown problem that we were working with, was also an NP problem. And and showing NP problem is not a difficult part actually. We just need to show that it can be verified. The certificate can be verified uh, very quickly. So if you could do, do those two things, then then it means that the, the new problem that we uh, we I mean uh, faced uh, was indeed NP complete problem. So I have a couple of uh, papers in which we proved some new problems to be NP complete, and uh, it, it, it is not actually 
it was not actually the difficult part or the main part of the uh, of the papers uh, because those papers are about something else but uh, that np completeness result came as a byproduct uh, but there is one especially a couple of papers in which uh, what we did was uh, we we started with a problem and we say that uh, that you can add more details or you can remove some details from the problem so when i say more details and some details it's it's not formal it's not uh, completely accurate what I'm trying to say, uh, but that that detail is a little bit involved. So I'm not telling you exactly what what is that add or subtract. Uh, so what we were trying to do is we were looking at some graphs, and by looking at those graphs, we said that okay, if if we allow certain properties of those graphs to be included, and if if we don't include those graphs, right? So we came up with a sequence of those properties. So property one, property two, property three, and so on. And uh, each property would be a little, uh, little bit more than that, right? So it, it will increase the possibilities in, in the underlying graph. So we proved that there was a limit, there was a limit, there was a limiting point. And the limiting point was that if you add more to this one, what you will get would be NP complete. And if you go this direction, you will get P. So, so we proved that this is the minimum thing that you can remove. Removing afterwards will make the problem too easy to be solved in P. And if you don't remove it, then the, remain, the problem will remain uh, in P complete. So this was a boundary, uh, some kind of boundary property. The boundary also appears in one of in, in the title of, of that paper as well. Anyway, so so it's not that how how we uh, show that it's not all guesswork. It, it's it requires some practice. It requires uh, experience with working with such problems and uh, more problems that you will study. Uh, you will figure it out that how to reduce it. So I think I I mentioned this uh, author Johnson. Uh, he was one of the authors who wrote about, uh, who wrote a comprehensive book about uh, P and NP complete problems. Uh, I think the book was published somewhere in 78 to 79, 1978 and 1979. Uh, at that time, the concept of P and NP complete and this question about P is equal to NP was very new. It was around like maybe 10 years, something like that. And uh, even by that time, hundreds of problems were known to be NP complete. So, so Johnson is one of the authors, I, I forgot about the name of the other author. So these two authors came up with, with a detailed discussion about what is P problem, what are P problems, what are NP problems, and how do we classify P in, in NP. And then they gave a comprehensive list of around 250, 300 problems, which were known to be NP complete at, at that time. So they did not just provide a, a name of the problem that this is an NPMP problem, rather they showed that why that particular problem is NPMP. So they gave a proof that why that problem is NPMP. So if you are interested in this, uh, this area, and suppose you are working in algorithms or in complexity, and uh, you're solving any, any problem that you might face, for example, from data mining or machine learning or from any, any area of your interest, and you come to a conclusion that the underlying problem is too difficult to solve, or whatever attempts you are, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, all of your attempts have been futile, uh, then probably that problem is difficult problem. And, and if you could mathematically show that that problem has been made, uh, then you don't have to spend so much uh, time in finding an exact solution rather than approximate solution will be, will be good enough. So by looking at those proofs, like 300 proofs or maybe more uh, by now, now at this time, thousands and tens of thousands of problems are known, are known to be NP complete. And every day there are many problems which are shown to be NP complete and people don't even write uh, papers about it. They become byproduct in one of the papers. So if, even if you prove that some problem, some unknown problem is, is NP complete, <clears throat> it is not a paper worthy kind of contribution. So, 
So you just read those proofs and see that what are the structure of the problem that they are working with and how they are deducing it. And you can try one of them. So first attempts, maybe uh, you may fail in first couple of attempts, then you will have a good idea that how to, how to proceed. But all the problems that we will consider in this class or an exam, uh, most of the time, those problems can be shown to be incomplete by the problems that we already know, right? Since there are thousands of problems to be, uh, which are known to be incomplete, uh, but I cannot expect that you know all of those problems by heart or you remember the how, how those, uh, uh, what is the structure of, of, of those problems. Rather than we will focus on few problems, maybe five problems, four problems, and uh, if you know the structure of, of those four or five problems, then you should be able to prove a lot of other problems to be uh, to the end of the day. Uh, and one key thing is that what, once all attempts fail, okay, suppose that you are in, in, a, in a fine, you, you are in a position that you have tried all uh, things and no, nothing works, then as a final resort, this satisfiability problem, can be used to reduce from, to show that the unknown problem is NP-complete. So most problems that you will see, which are NP-complete, so you would find set on the left-hand side, and then you would see this one, and then you would have this new uh, problem X, this unknown problem X, and you would also prove that X is in NP to show that X is NP-complete. Yes. Sure, we know how to uh, prove if any problem is NP complete or not, but is there any way to find out if the problem is not NP complete? Yes. Very simple. So there are two things for NP for any problem to be NP complete. What are those those things? First, that problem has to be NP, and every problem in NP must reduce to it. If one of these two conditions fail, the problem is not NP. Yes, but the second condition is not too easy to check for, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree that second condition is not easy to check, but uh, but for the for the next for the second condition, we have the transitivity property. Suppose you pick one um, NP-complete problem and you try to reduce to it reduce that NP complete problem to your unknown problem. And if, if you fail in reduction, then this is an indication that this problem may not be NP complete. But the biggest indication is that that problem is not in NP. If you can show that the problem is not in NP, then you are, you are good, that the problem is not in NP. Okay. Okay, but I understand, yeah, it's, it's not, straightforward, uh, it, it requires some work. Anyway, so do you, do you uh, remember what was the set problem? The set problem is that given any Boolean formula, does there exist a truth assignment to the variables phi, which make phi satisfiable. Okay, and by satisfiable means that it evaluates to a true value, right? So if such um, assignment exists, that formula is, is, uh, is satisfiable. Now, said is, is a difficult problem. Why it is a difficult problem? Just imagine that I give you an arbitrary formula and that arbitrary formula contains so many variables. For example, there's X1 or X2, let's say. Or X2 complement or X3 or X4 complement, let's say, and X5 complement or X6 or X7 complement and X1 or X2 or X3 complement or X4 or X6 and X2 complement or X3 complement and, and so on and so forth, right? So on and so forth. 
So given any such uh, uh, formula, you know that these formulas are connected by a disjunction. So this is disjunction, which we call logical or as, uh, logical end as well, right? And this formula is, sorry. This is called conjunction. And this is called disjunction. Which we call logical or. And you already know the truth table for uh, and as well as or. So, for example, if you have two variables a and b, then there are four possibilities of these a and b. So we have true and true. So let's uh, make them zero one. Okay. So zero one zero 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 one one zero one one, right? So a and b and a or b. So it is zero, 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 one. It is, uh, it is zero, one, one, one. Right? So we know that whenever um, the two possibilities around, I mean, uh, so whenever we have this end operator, this end operator requires that both its operand must be true in order for that value to be true. And whenever we have R operator, then any one of them is true, the whole thing is true. Now, if you look at this arbitrary formula phi, this arbitrary formula is basically a formula written in CNF. So what does this CNF represent? It means conjunction, conjunctive, normal form. That is, it has conjunction connecting these things, which we call clauses. Okay, so there are many clauses. There might be one, two, three, four, five, any number of clauses. And all those clauses have this junction inside its variables, right? Internally, they have disjunctions and externally they have conjunctions. So when we have conjunctions between do, those things, then we say that phi is, for, is satisfied if this conjunction is true, this conjunction is true, this conjunction is true, this conjunction. If all the conjunctions, all the components of this conjunction are true, then the whole thing is true. But internally, if one of them is true, if x1 is true, then we do not care what is value of x2 or x3, x4, the whole thing would be true. If x6 is true over here, the whole clause would be true, right? Uh, similarly, if, if uh, x2 is true here, then it's fine, right? The whole thing would be true. If x3 is false, then the whole thing is true. So we know that what will make each clause true. So what you need to do is you need to find out one variable or a complement of a variable will, which will make the clause true. And if you can come up with such assignment for each and every clause, then you would you know that the formula is, uh, is true. But the problem is that we do not have any number of variables over here. The number of variables could be three, it could be four, it could be five, it could be 100, it could be 1 million, it could be trillion. And we haven't specified that how many elements, how many variables we have inside each clause. So over here in the first clause, we have four. In the second clause, we have three. In the third clause, we have five. In the fourth clause, we have just two. So we can have two uh, variables or one variable or three variables or 10 variables or 100 variables in, in each clause. So a general CNF formula can have any number of clauses and any number of variables in a clause. So if I say, if I ask you to write a program in Java or C++ or Python, uh, that takes such a formula as input and comes up with a solution which says that if you assign x1 true, x2 false, x3 false, x4 true, and so on and so forth, it will satisfy this formula, then it is not an easy task, right? You need to check each and every possibility, right? So if there are many clauses and many variables, it will take a lot of time because you need to, comp if you need to check each and every possible combination of these variables, right? And you know that the combinations and the number of variables grow exponentially. We have just two variables, there are four possibilities. If you have three variables, we have eight possibilities. If you have four variables, we have 16 possibilities. If you have n variables, then we have two power n possibilities. So you can imagine that we just don't have n variables, we have n variables or complements of n variables, right? So a variable can appear as itself or it can appear as complement of itself. So it means that there are so many uh, things that we need to try before we can come up with an answer. So satisfiability is definitely not an easy problem to solve. But how do we show that this is NP-complete? It was done by Cook and Levin. So we will not go into the proof, uh, but we will show that 
there is a problem which is very similar to set problem, but it is not exactly set problem. And that is also NP complete. Okay. And what is that problem? So we call that problem three set. Okay. And we say that three set is NP complete. What is this three set? In three set, we have a Boolean formula in which each clause, first of all, phi is in CNF format. Each clause has at most three literals. What is meant by literal? A literal means a variable or negation of a variable. For example, x1 or x2 complement or x3 and x2, let's say x1 or x4 or x3 complement and x2 or x3 complement or x4 complement and so on. So this is a formula which we call a formula in 3CNF. Why 3CNF? Because we have many clauses. So, so there is no restriction that how many clauses will this formula have, it can have one clause or two clauses or three or four or any number of clauses. Uh, so we can say that the formula appears in this format. So we have a clause one and clause two and clause three and so on and so forth, right? So we can have any number of clauses. Let's say we have uh, K clauses and each clause CI can be any variable XI1 or XI two or X, I, three. So let's call it Y, it's not X. Y, I, one or Y, I, two or Y, I, three. Where each Y, I, J is X, I, J or X, I, J complement. <clears throat> Okay, so it could, it could be either the variable itself or its negation. So each clause will have at most three variables or their negations. Now, so, so the result says that even if we restrict our formula to be in three CNF format, three CNF format means it's in CNF format and each clause has at most three variables, still the problem is NP complete. And we can show that uh, we can show that this problem actually, uh, the set problem reduces to three sets. So we can prove it by reducing the set problem, which is the generalized problem to three sets. Okay. Now we have one more generalization and we have two sets. In two sets, we have a formula phi, which is C1 and C2 and C3, and let's say CK, K clauses. And each CI is, uh, y i one or y i two, where we, we where each y i j is equal to either x i j or x i j complement. Now this is called C, two CNF. So in two CNF, each clause has can, has exactly or at most uh, two variables or their negation. Okay, and for this we know that two set is in P. Okay, it's, it's a surprising result. So if each clause contains two variables, then this problem is easy to solve. We can find out a polynomial type solution and this problem is in P. But if each clause contains three or more, then that problem has no efficient solution and that is an, uh, that is, uh, an NP complete problem. Okay. Okay, so next we show that there is a problem called clique and that clique problem is also NP complete. Sir, should we know the proof for uh, SAT and reset? No. Okay. If you are interested, please read the proof, read the proof from the book. Uh, but the Cook-Levin proof is a little bit involved. Uh, 
it's it's a bit difficult. So if if you skip it, that's fine. That is not included in the course. That is not. Uh, I mean, I will not ask any question about it. I will not ask about uh, ask any question about the proof of this uh, theorem in, in exam. But if you are interested, please please go ahead read it. Okay. So we say that clique is NP complete. What is clique? Do you remember? So when I write clique in the small letters, it means it's a property of a graph. When I write clique in all caps, small caps, it means I'm talking about the problem of finding a clique. So a clique is a complete subgraph. Okay, a clique is a complete subgraph. Okay, and what is a clique problem? A clique problem is basically given a graph in some number T or K, whatever you want to call it, The graph G has a clique of size at least K. Sorry. At most K. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the clique problem. So clique is also NP-complete. Um, can you show that it is NP-complete? The proof is very easy. I will uh, give a proof. Uh, and in the proof, we, we reduce three sets to clique. Okay, we reduce three sets to clique and I will show you how we do it after we come back from uh, the break. Uh, so let me tell you a few other problems which are uh, NP complete and uh, then we will come up with the proof. So there's a problem called vertex cover. Do you know what is a vertex cover? No, sir. Vertex cover is a sim uh, the problem where we have a graph and a K and we say that G is an undirected graph. has a K node vertex cover. When I write it in the small, it means the property. When I write it in cap, uh, it means that um, it's the name of the problem. So what is a vertex cover? So if you have a graph G, then the vertex, so if, if we have a graph G, which is a set of vertices and edges, and it is an undirected graph, then we say that a vertex graph of G is a subset of the vertices of G with, where uh, each and every edge from the graph touches one of the nodes in this graph, one of the vertices in this graph. For example, let's consider uh, this, this graph. Okay. Now, if I say that uh, I have this vertex and I have this vertex, so if I say that this is A, B, C, and D, so V contains A, B, C, and D. So if I say my vertex cover, V, C, is B and D, then this is V, this V, C is a subset of V, okay? B and D are the vertices from the entire graph, but, you can see that each and every edge that is in this graph, each and every edge that is in this graph. So let me show this, these edges in different color. Each and every edge that is in this graph has an end point in this thing, right? So there's an edge AB, so B is here. There's an edge BC, so B is here. There's an edge BD where B and D both are in here. There's an edge AD, so D is here. There's an edge DC, so D is here. So e, for each and every edge that you find in your graph, one of the endpoints of that edge is in this set. If you find such a graph, that graph is called a vertex cover, okay? Now, every graph has a trivial vertex cover, which you, where you include each and every vertex of, of the graph. 
but that's a trivial vertex, right? So what we need to find out, we need to find out a vertex cover of smaller size, right? So if I include all vertices A, B, C, D, then definitely this will become a vertex cover, but this vertex cover has size four. So is it possible to have a vertex cover of size three? Of course. Is it possible to have a vertex cover of size two? Of course. B and D is a vertex cover of size two. Is, there a, is, is it possible to have a vertex cover of size one? In this particular graph, no. In some graphs, yes. Okay, so let's, let's look, uh, look at this graph. This is sometimes called a star graph. Okay, so if I, in, if I, let's say I call it A. So if I say, say my vertex cover just contains A, then this A is basically a vertex cover because this, this A is an end point to each and every vertex of this graph, right? But suppose I have this edge here and this edge here and this edge here. Now this A is no longer a vertex cover because this A covers this edge and 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 this edge, but it does not cover this edge and this edge, right? So in order to cover those edges, we need to have either this or this or this, either this or this in one of this or this, right? So we have to have two more vertices. So vertex cover of a graph is a graph is a, is a vertex cover of graph is a subset of vertices such that each and every edge in the graph has one end point in that set. And our goal is to find out the minimum such set. While when we are doing clique, we need to find out the maximum such clique, right? So we are interested in finding a clique of maximum size. When we are trying to find vertex cover, we are interested in finding a vertex cover of smallest size. So we, we show that vertex cover is in is NP complete. Okay. And how do we prove that the vertex cover is NP complete? There are multiple proofs for that. We reduce three set again to vertex cover. And there are easier way to show that this is also NP complete and we will look at uh, one of those things uh, after we come back from the break. So let's have a break for maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. <clears throat> and when we come back, uh, we will look at the proofs of these two problems. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. Sorry for that. So in this particular graph, <clears throat> I've identified three vertices, X1 complement, X2 and X2. So this X2 is from clause one. This X1 complement is from clause two, and this X2 is from clause three. So it says that if we pick this X2, which is here, and if we pick this X1 complement, which is here, and if we pick X2, which is here, then this will satisfy. And you can check with that it will satisfy. So if we make X2 true, if we make X1 complement, if you make X1 is zero and X2 equal to two, uh, zero, X2 equal to zero, one, then it will satisfy this one, it will satisfy this one, it will satisfy this one, and pi will be equal to one. Now the proof that why such a um, why such a um, correspondence work because in order for a, in order for us to find a clique of size um, k we have to pick one vertex from each and every clause right why we need to pick one vertex from each and every clause we need to pick one vertex from each and every clause because no two vertices are connected here. Right? No two vertices are connected within one clause. So there is no connection between X1 and X1 here or X2 here. So all the connections are to the vertices in, in different clause, clauses. So in order for any clique to exist here, any clique of size more than one, we need to pick one vertex for each and every clause that we have. So since we have three clauses here, then a clique of size three must, uh, must be a one where one vertex from each and every clause is selected. 
So we have one vertex from here, one vertex from here, one vertex from here. And you know that there is no connection between X1 and X complement or X2 and X2 complement and X3 and X3 complement. So no variable is connected to its complement. It is only connected to other variables or it is connected with it with, with themselves, right? So this will only happen. So for example, if you are able to figure it out, then it will, it will mean that there is an independent variable which can be found in a clause such that it will satisfy that clause. So when you pick one, one literal from one clause, it will actually satisfy that clause. And clique means that since we are finding one clause from each clause, uh, one vertex from each clause, it means all clauses are satisfied. And if all clauses are satisfied, we know that all those clauses are connected with, with a conjunction. Therefore, the complete formula is satisfied. So we have this result. It says that phi is satisfiable if and only if G has a key, key clique. Yes. In graph theory, uh, I don't think each vertex has any value. So how does this correspondence work? How are we assigning values to vertices? The values these are not values. These are val these are not values. These are variables. These are the names. Uh, zero or one? No, no, no. Okay. So we picked x two. So if a variable which we picked is just a variable, not just negation, then it will become one. If we pick the variable that is, it's, it's, which, is, which is the negation of some variable, then that variable, so for example, so whatever variable that you pick, you just assign one. Here. So we assign one here, we assign one here, we assign one here. But since X2 appears as X2, so X2 is one. Now X1 complement is one. This means X1 is zero. Complement is, uh, I mean, it's a, its own inverse, right? If you if you take complement twice, you you revert back to the variable, right? If x one complement is one, then x one must be zero. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Right. Similarly, x two is, is is one. So whatever variable that you choose from these clauses, you assign one. So remember what? Why did we get this graph? We were trying to solve the satisfiability problem. We were not trying to solve the graph problem. But we have a solution for a graph problem. So we ask this Turing machine M, which supposedly solves the clique problem, to tell us if there exists such a solution. And if, it, if there exists such a solution, we also want our Turing machine to give us a list of those variables, a list of those vertices, which make up a clique. Okay? And once we receive that solution, we just assign one to each of those variables, and we have the satisfaction. Okay, is this in clear? Yes, so you sir. can try another example, for example, let's say uh, phi is, uh, let's say X1 or X2 complement or X3 or uh, not all, in X1 complement or X2 or X3, and x1 or x2 or x3 complement and x1 complement or x2 complement or x3 complement. That's it. So we have four clauses here, right? So we have, so let's call it c1, c2, c3, c4. So for c1, we would have x1, x2 complement, x3. For C2, you will have X1 complement, X2, X3. For C3, we will have X1, X2, X3 complement. For X4, you will have X1 complement, X2 complement, and X3 complement. Now, how would we connect? So this X1 cannot be connected with any variable which is X1 complement. So it, so this line is not correct, right? So we should not connect it. But this can be connected here, here. It can be connected here. It can be connected here. It can be connected here, right? Similarly, we cannot connect this one. This is wrong. Why? Because one of them is X1. The other one is X1 complement. But we can connect here. We can connect here. 
right? So we will do the same thing again. So this can be connected, but this cannot be connected. But then we have this one. And then we have this one and no and yes. Then we have oops, this one, this one, and this one. Similarly, we can have this one, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and no there. Yes, yes. And then we will repeat the same process for the second clause and check what are the edges that are missing. So this X1 complement has to be connected with, with, uh, with X2, which is already there. Uh, so what about this one? It has to be there, this, and this. Uh, this cannot be connected. Uh, yes, it, it, it cannot be connected, but it can be connected here. It can be connected there. So this X2 and X3 and X1, X3. Then X3 will have to be connected here, here, and here, and here, right? Then X1 has to be connected with uh, this X2, this X3, uh, this one, this one, this one, this one. I hope I have covered all edges. So in this um, complicated graph, try to figure out if you can find if you can find a clique of size four. So in order to find a clique of size four, you need to uh, get one vertex from here, right? One vertex from here, one vertex from here, one vertex from here. And we know that they would be, so if you pick any four vertices, which is, if it is possible to pick any such four vertices, which creates a clique, then you know that all those vertices will be connected with each other. And those vertices will either be the copies of themselves or they would be different vertices. No vertex is, is labeled with something which is the complement of itself, right? So X1 is, is never connected with X1 complement or X2 is never connected with X2 complement and so on and so forth. So if you, if you choose you a variable... With me? So I will try. I'll try it again. So when you choose a variable from each clause, you have guarantee that the variable that you have chosen from the other clause will never be its complement, right? Because this is how we create this graph. So if this graph has a clique of size four, then the underlying formula that we have is satisfied. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so let's move on and uh, we have vertex cover problem. So for, for vertex cover problem, we before vertex cover problem, there's another problem that I would like to uh, talk about and that is actually easier to deal. Okay, so we talked about vertex cover. So let's talk about another problem which is very related to vertex cover, which you call independent set. And once we have independent set, understanding about independent set, we will know that they are connected. So what is an independent set? So independent set problem says that for a given undirected graph, G and a number K. So if you have an, if, if you have an undirected graph G and a number K, uh, we should recognize if G contains an independent set with at least K vertices. Okay, so what is an independent graph? Uh, independent set, the so given a graph G, B and E, we say a set of vertices 
of V, that is S is a subset of V, is independent if no two vertices in S are joined by an edge. Okay, so let's take an example. Suppose this is a graph. Okay, suppose this is a graph. If you pick this vertex and this vertex and this vertex, okay, then these three vertices form an independent set. Why? Because this vertex is not endpoint of any edge, which also has an endpoint, either this edge or this edge, uh, this vertex or this vertex, right? So these, these no two vertices in this set have a common edge, right? So for example, you cannot include this blue vertex and this red vertex in an in independent set because these two vertices, this vertex red and this vertex blue, have an edge, right? So they cannot be an independent set. So these vertices in red are independent. Set. They form an independent set. Okay. So remember when I said, well, what is a vertex cover? A vertex cover is a subset of vertices of graph and undirected graph such that, such that each and every edge in the graph has an end point in the vertex cover. Okay. Now the independent set is a set of vertices where they are not common. So there, there is no edge in the graph, which is common to uh, both, uh, common to any vertex, any, any pair of vertices in, 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 uh, in, in that set, right? So there is no edge that joins uh, any, any of these two vertices because this red vertex and this red vertex are not joined. So no two vertex vertices in this, this set are joined by an edge. So when we have vertex cover, we need to find a, vert a vertex cover of minimum size. When we are doing independent set, we need to find an independent set of maximum size. So we need to prove that independent set is also NP-complete. So we show that independent set is NP-complete. And how can we prove it? We can prove it using three sets. We can prove it by independent set. How can we do that? We can do very easily as we did before. So imagine there is a formula phi, uh, which contains clauses as C1, C2, CK. So there are K clauses. Okay, if there are K clauses, uh, then, um, then you know the number of uh, variables in that, right? Now what you can do, you can correspond correspond to three sets and an independent set problem with input. So we convert, we create a graph GF, G5. So we have V5 and E5. What is this phi? Phi is the part where G phi is an undirected graph with a set of vertices which are equal to, so let's suppose there are K clauses and each clause contain, uh, so CI contains PI1 or PI2 or PI3. It will be PI1, PI2, and PI3. Okay. 
So what? So this is about the vertices. What about the edge? So if there are two vertices here. Sir, but why do we have three vertices? Sorry, not three vertices. Three vertices. Uh, we will have uh, for each clause C i. We will have three vertices. So so if there are k k clauses, then we have c times uh, three times k clause uh, c times uh, k vertices. So we say that we pick two vertices and we will connect those two vertices if and only if one of the following two conditions uh, satisfy. Okay. And uh, what is that condition? And that condition is that those two variables are similar. Okay. And if those two variables are not similar, then we connect. So for example, there's a variable X1 and there's a variable X1. Uh, just give me a second. There's some insect on my table. So we will uh, connect x1 to x1. So if there are two variables which are same in two clauses, we will connect them. And we will, otherwise we will connect like this one. So let me show you an example and it will be clear that what I'm trying to say. Suppose there's a formula phi which is X1 or X2 complement or X3. X1 or X2 complement or X3. And we have X1 complement or X3 complement. Let's say we, we do not go with C set and it's fine. X1 or X3. So what you would do? we would create a graph. So we would create a graph like this. So, so, re so remember when we were trying to create a graph or clique, we just created triple triplets, which such that they, there was no connection between them. But this time we would create a graph in which each subgraph would be a clique in itself. So we would create a clique for this, we would create a clique for this, and we would create a clique for this. So we have X1 here, we have X2 complement here, and we have X3 complement. So all these three vertices are from the same clause. So all these three vertices would be connected. Then the second clause, second clause contains X1 complement and X3 complement. First of all, there are just two vertices. So this will, this is a clause. Now we have X1 and we have X3. So these will be connected. So this is the first thing that we will connect, right? So within the clause, we will connect each vertices, vertex with every vertex. Now we will connect the vertices outside uh, their, uh, outside the clause. Now X1 will be connected X1 will be connected with X1 complement because it is outside, okay? X3 will be connected with X3 complement and this X3 will complement will be connected with X3 complement as well. Now this is X1, so this X1 will also be connected with X1 complement. Remember, we are, not con uh, we are not connecting this X1 with X1 or X3 with X3 and so on and so forth. We are not connect doing it, right? Now, when, once we find such a graph, what we need to do, we need to find out, we need to find out an independent set. If we find out an independent set in this graph, then that independent set will correspond, will correspond to satisfiable. Okay, so let me pick uh, an independent set. So let's suppose I pick this vertex and this vertex and this vertex. Are these, Three are these three vertices creating an independent set? Yes, because there is no yeah. edge between this X2 complement with any of the other red vertices. And the same thing is for uh, X3 complement and X1 over here, right? So no two vertices which are marked as red 
have any edge between them. So this is definitely an independent set. And this is an independent set of size what? This is an independent size set of size three. And this three corresponds to the number of clauses in our formula. Okay, so the, what is the size of independent set here? Size is three. And uh, what, what is the number of clauses in our formula? Three. So we have an independent size, set of size three, and that is also the size of uh, the number of clauses. So once we have uh, these vertices selected, just assign one to each one of uh, these variables. So we have x1, so x1 equal to one, right? So we have x2 complements, so x2 complement is one. And x3 complement, so x3 complement is one. So this implies x1 is one, x2 is zero, and x3 is equal to zero. So this is the values, these are the values which will satisfy this Boolean formula, okay? So we say that phi is satisfied or satisfiable if and only if this graph G phi has an independent set of size k. What is this k? K is the number of clauses in our formula. Okay, and why this is why this is the case that this is going to happen? Because we said that this is an independent set, right? So if this is an independent set, it means that these are not, these are never going to be connected. So X2 is not connected with the X3 complement or X2 is not connected with X1. Now, since they are not connected, it means that changing the values of one of them will not impact the values of the other set. So if we have set a value, which is uh, with, for one of those variables, then since they are all connected in, in a clique form, so whatever the number of, uh, what, what, whatever the number of variables we have in a, in a clause, since they, they, they are all connected, therefore one of them, se selecting one of them will satisfy that form. And making sure that we have the same number of, uh, vari uh, same number of variables in the independent set as the number of clauses, it means that each clause is independently uh, satisfiable. And if each clause is satisfiable, and since all clauses are connected by a conjunction, so the whole formula is satisfied. Okay, now let's come back to our vertex cover problem. So the vertex cover problem is a problem where we find out a set of vertices from the graph such that, um, such that it covers each and every edge of, uh, each and every edge of the, uh, of the graph. So what we can do, we can, we can actually reduce the independent set independent set problem to our vertex cover problem. Okay. So let me give you an example. Let's say this is our graph. This is just an example graph. So in this example graph, I will color some vertices blue and I will color some vertices red. Remember, this is an undirected graph. So my claim is that this these vertices in red form a vertex cover. And in the vertices in blue form an independent set. Is it clear? So you can see that once you select all those vertices which are in blue, it forms an independent set because there is no edge between any of these two vertices, any pair of vertices in that set. But if you pick all the vertices which are in red, you see that all edges of the graph are covered, right? Now I will create, a, I will make a claim. Okay, and what is that claim? The claim is that, that a graph G has an independent set with at least K nodes or vertices, if and only if G has 
a vertex cover with at most v minus k nodes. So how many nodes we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. What is the size of independent set here? Three. So seven minus three is four. What is the size of the vertex for here? Four. Okay, so what we see that the vertex cover problem and independent set problem are very connected. So if you find a vertex cover, then you know that all those vertices which are not in the vertex cover are basically independent. They form an independent set. And if you solve the independent set problem, then you know that all those vertices which are not uh, in the independent set, they are in the vertex cover. And interestingly, since both vertex cover and in, in, in independent set are NP complete, then by definition, you can, you can reduce any problem to the other one. So you can remove, reduce vertex cover to independent set. You can also reduce independent set to vertex cover. So it depends on how uh, you see it. How do you look at it? Okay, uh, so I think we should end here. Uh, I just need to give one uh, definition uh, and then we will not go into detail of that definition. And that definition is about NP hard problems. So we say that a language A is called NP hard if there's only one condition for all languages B and NP reduced to A in polynomial time. Okay, so I will show it from the picture. So this is NP. We call this problem, let's say you call it B. This is B is NP complete. because every problem reduces to this problem, right? Every problem reduces to this problem. And this problem also is also in, inside, P, inside NP. But there's a problem here, which we call A, such that every problem reduces here. Then we would call this problem A and B hard problem. Remember this A is outside in NP. So we can redefine our NP completeness as follows. First of all, uh, we say that a problem X is NP complete if X is NP hard to X is We will not uh, uh, go into the detail. Uh, I think we should stop here. Uh, this requires a lot of discussion, but we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have enough time. So I will end this lecture here. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, if there's any other question related to exam or quizzes, um, you can post it on LMS or you can send me an email. There was a question about N minus one quizzes. We will still go with this, this N minus one quizzes regarding the grades of class quiz and midterm and problem set. I will post them uh, with the results of final exam and final exam will be online. It will happen on the same time, which was planned for the uh, in-person exam, but this time it will be now online. But make sure that you have, um, uh, I mean, electricity, I mean, you cannot make sure that you have electricity, but let's say you are, if you're using a tablet or, or a computer, then make sure that those are already charged, fully charged. And you have some arrangement for the alternate or internet, right? And uh, our exam will not be for the full time, two hours and a half. Uh, maybe it will be a bit shorter uh, and, and we will have enough time for you to scan your solution and upload on, on the LMS. Okay, so with this, I, uh, I, I would stop here. I think this was our last class. And thank you very much for this class. And
Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for Thank you, your sir. Efforts. I just have one question, if you could allow me for that. Sure. Um, sir, what would be the weightage for the final exam? I think I've already put it in the syllabus, right? So, yes, sir. I, I saw that and it, uh, it was written that it's about 30%. But sir, wasn't it previously uh, around 20 or 24%? Yeah, I had to increase it because uh, we couldn't do as many problem sets as I thought we would be able to do and as many quizzes as I thought we would be able to do. So I increased the final a uh, little bit. So it's just 30% now. It's not it's not significantly higher than what I actually thought about it, but it's 30%. All right, sir. Um, okay, sir. Okay. Uh, sir. Anything else? Yes. Uh, sir, actually, I wanted to talk to you about uh, my assignment submission. Okay. What do you want to talk about? Uh, problem set one and quiz one. Sir, actually, I was enrolled late, so I did not have access to LMS. Okay. You, sub you submitted by email, right? Yes. And you haven't okay. applied to it. It doesn't matter. So when I will finalize the grade and when I post those grades on LMS and... Uh, and the portal um, check at that time. So if if we, if it doesn't appear on on your portal, please let me know, and I will I, I will update. So I will make sure that I check my emails for all those submissions which were done not by LMS but by email, and I will try to accommodate all of that. But if Thank if you. any if by any chance I miss miss any of that. Um, then please let me. So I will. I think I will first uh, put the grades on LMS, and once we are happy with all those grades, um, and there are no uh, queries about those, then I will post those grades on board. Sure. Thank you, sir. Sir, my quiz three marks are not uploaded yet. Sure, I will do it. The marks for quiz four are also not uploaded. Yet. Yeah, I haven't graded quiz four. I will grade. Uh, I will grade it soon. Maybe today or tomorrow. Okay. okay anything else? So is make to come online. Uh, what? Time yeah, I will be online. I will be. Yeah, I will be online. So in next semester, I'm teaching a course called Computational Complexity Theory. So, so whatever that we have covered in last couple of weeks or less. So there's an entire course on that uh, topic. So if you are more interested in, in this area, in this topic, um, so we will not only cover just NP and NP completeness or NP hardness, we will go into more, much more detail uh, with, with proofs and other things. And we will cover so many other things that we have not been able to cover here. So that is a 500 level course. Um, and that is an elective. So if you are interested, you can, you can take that. So this course, that course would be open for all uh, graduate students, uh, but I think some of the undergrad will also be able to take it. Yeah, so that depends if, if they allow us to take an elective, then we sure. can choose it. Yeah, uh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Take care and good luck for this exam and maybe you, have, you might have other courses. Uh, so good luck for all the exams. Stay safe, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Allah Thank you. Allah Thank you. Allah Thank you. Allah